Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jan Roos. And I am here with an interview that I am surprised didn't happen sooner. So uh, this is we are speaking today with David Nagel. Um, some of you guys might have heard of him. Uh, I've heard some fantastic. Uh, he's been a great guest on Friend of the Pod, Molly McGrath. Uh, we've technically shared a sk- stage, although he was the keynote. So he was a little higher up on that stage, the Law Firm Growth Summit. Um, but I've been listening to David for the last couple of years. Super excited to have him on. Uh, And we have some great stuff to go over around mindset, how to get out of your own way, and all kinds of fantastic stuff. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast, David. Yeah, my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. I'm honored. So uh, to kind of get started, I've been uh, kind of immersing myself in your content for the last couple of days in preparation for this interview. Um, I know there's some people in the audience who've heard of you, but um, just uh, for the people who haven't, let's talk a little bit about how you got to starting working with lawyers in the first place. Well, that's a that's really an interesting conversation. So there there's a um, uh, friend of mine. Well, he's a friend. He's a friend now. He wasn't at the time. Um, a guy approached me. I'm trying to think. Uh, probably around 2011, I think it was. Um, and the he he had he had just gone through a, just a catastrophic experience. He lost his his law firm. His wife uh, was was very sick. And they basically lost everything. He didn't have any money. But he also realized that he didn't know how to start over. So I, somehow or another, he heard about me. I'm not, I, I don't remember what, how that was. Um, so he came to us and he said, what, is there, what could you do to help me? And we told him, you know, look, we need to have an entire VIP day with you. Like, we need to find out what you did, what happened, what's wrong. What what do you need to start over? What needs to be filled, reconstructed, build it out, the whole thing? And he didn't have the money for it. So it took him, I think it took him six months. He was making it like he would he would earn some money and he would send it to us. And he would call my CEO, who was not my CEO at the time, Steph Tuss. Um, but he would call her and be like, I got another five thousand, or I got another thousand. And he would he would send it. And eventually, long story short, he 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 came in and we started. Um, we started working with him and he had a dream to be, he recognized something like he, he was really teaching me something at the same time, which was, you know, he's like, Hey, attorneys go to school. They get all this information. They come out and they have no idea how to build a business. And I was like, yeah, I guess that's true. Isn't it? I'm like, I did never really thought about that before. He said, yeah. And they stay stuck unless they go to work for somebody else's firm. They really don't know what they're doing. And on top of it, kind of based in their education with their kind of ego build with having to be right and learning what it is that they need to know. They're very resistant to hearing that they don't know what they're doing uh, and to get that information out to them. So I remember we started off with, he, I don't, it, we, he was going around to different meetings where attorneys, I guess, were getting um, like credit every year or something. Where they yeah, CLEs. Their, CLEs. Thank you very much. And uh, we, it took us a year to figure out how to create a talk that actually worked, where they could hear the idea that they actually needed help so that they would actually do something about it. So he started to build how to manage a small law firm. And it was, it started off very small. I talked to him about two weeks ago. I think he's at about 30 million this year. But because I worked with him and he started working with all these attorneys, uh, you know, all throughout the United States, I started getting a tremendous amount of business from attorneys based on mindset, sales, and then later on uh, some more of the construction of their business, depending on where it was that they wanted to go. But that's really how we ended up getting big with with uh, with with attorneys. Okay, and that's an awesome story. And I'll also say this too for anyone um, who isn't familiar. That's our John Robbins, also a former guest of the podcast, um, yeah, wildly successful John. entrepreneurs, and, and one of the big, uh, huge coach in the space. So no, it's a, okay. So the, the connection with our John was I didn't actually know that story. So that's fantastic. Yeah. 
And um, you mentioned something that I want to definitely dive a little bit deeper on. And uh, this is kind of leading up to my next question, which is, um, you know, everyone has their own experience from either being an attorney or in our case working with them. But I do think it's a very specific type of person that's drawn to the profession. So what kind of mindset blocks do you see that are more prevalent in attorneys than in, you know, other businesses and other professions that you work with? Well, one of the mindset blocks is is the idea that um, that that they have this view that if they need to learn something that they don't know that there's something wrong with them. It's an ego thing, mm. uh, and it 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 might be partly psychological, depending on what their upbringing was. Uh, this is also something that we see almost in any professional endeavor that comes out of the middle class. So when you have people that come out of the middle class and the working class, and they, they're they looking to shoot higher in their life, and they go spend a tremendous amount of time and money uh, in college, and they come out, they don't want to hear that they don't know what they're doing, right? So, But they're studying to be a doctor, or they're studying to be a lawyer, or they're studying to be a dentist. I mean, they're really learning something that takes a long time to learn, and then to go out there and really work on that skill set. But what they don't learn is how to be a business person. They have no, they have no information around business whatsoever. And there's almost an assumption that it should be easy. Like this shouldn't be a problem. I should be able to, you know, like this shouldn't be difficult at all. And many of them just fall flat on their face. And they have, for whatever reason, they have some trouble asking for help. And it, like I said, it took us a year. It took Archon and I a year to figure out how do we, how do we construct this talk so that they can actually hear what he's saying without shutting down the moment that he started speaking, because that's what was happening at these CLE events. He would start talking, and they were like, I don't need this guy. I know what I'm doing. And they're failing. They don't know what they're doing. Like, if if you were to talk with them private, and they were telling you what was happening, they're literally failing. But they couldn't hear the message, because it was almost like our John was saying, there's something wrong with you. And that's not what he was saying, but that's what they were hearing. So once we got past that, it began to explode. And then I think Arjun kind of set a culture up out there, to be honest with you, where it became um, uh, it became more acceptable to say, "Hey, I need help doing this. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing." At least I can tell you that I've noticed a huge shift in the people having conversations with attorneys all over. They have a completely different mindset around it. But I think it's a combination of you have to be right because you're an attorney, right? So you have to have this, uh, you have to have this incredible intellect and know what you're doing for your client. You can't mess that up. And the idea of where they were coming from out of their childhood to be, you know, uh, to have a kind of a higher station in life, which I think is is very commendable. But you put those two things together and you could end up with a blind spot that keeps you from progressing forward. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I think that the connection with the escape from the working or middle class is such a huge thing because it's something that a pattern that we've noticed a lot is that it's almost like their expertise in the legal profession itself and the actual practice of law almost kind of becomes a safe harbor whenever people are feeling insecure. You go out, you get a door slammed in your face or consultation, you try a marketing program or some sort of a new technique that doesn't work. And then you double down, you know, you add another, you add another CLE, you go back to school, you get your like master's in taxation or what have you. But at the end of the day, it's like, there's a, there's a door that only they can let themselves walk through to get to these higher levels, which I think you've been helping out people with a lot. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if this is, if this is something that's beyond the scope of the podcast, but What's the gist of how you were able to get this through to people if it's something you're able to share? Make it think there it was their idea. We had to figure out how to make it make them think it was their idea. Right. And I don't remember exactly how we did that because it's been it's been over a decade now, I think, since um we went down that road. But basically the idea was setting up a series of statistics, which was something that they could comprehend very easily and then kind of backdoor into uh, this is if this is where you at, you know, something is wrong, but it's not your fault type mm-hmm. of an idea, right? And then they would approach him with wanting to know more information. And then he we refined it and he had somebody else do the talks after that, and that was history. Okay. Once but once they thought it was their idea, then it was like I'm genius because I'm asking for help. <laughs> yeah, that's right? fantastic. And also, I mean, if you if you bullet, you know, letting people know it's not their fault, it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, that uh what a goodwill hunting <laughs> situation. Yeah. People don't want to be wrong and people overestimate how much of a drive not to be wrong is a motivation for people, you know, even ourselves if we want to be honest about it. 
But um, I think that's brilliant. And um, okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit about what people can kind of expect to benefit from, from really taking the time to focus on something that they probably don't think is a problem right now. <laughs> so I want to start off with an example. It's something that we see all the time. Um, so just for a little context on us, we do a lot of uh, marketing specifically with estate planning attorneys. And a lot of the times we have these situations where we have stuff that is turnkey out of the box, delivering consultations, great volume. And then we, the more we do, the more I'm surprised that people can figure out a way to steal defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, and at the end of the day, it becomes high stress. The engagements become really, really tough. Or, uh, you know, we have the situation where people just don't choose to move forward in the first place because they're so certain that it's not possible. So what do you think is happening with people that are getting all of the process, all the tools, all the things in place, but are not able to close that final gap when it comes to something like, you know, sales, which I know attorney has had a huge issue with. Yeah. So, so this is a great question. It could be it could be a couple of different things, but here's what it is first and foremost. What is the value of the system of the person that you're attempting to sell? So this is really important to know, and th and this is also where you see um, a bit of a mindset problem come in that's kind of formulated out of an assumption more than any kind of experience, and that is people tend people that come out of the middle class, and, and I say that very respectfully. What I'm, what I'm trying to draw contrast with is that their parents were not entrepreneurs, so they wouldn't learn these skill sets, right? They learned skill sets since they were a kid to go to work for somebody else. So when they're now operating their own firm and they're going to sell, they're looking for people that are like them. And that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous place because if you're selling something of high value to a person where their value system is more about getting a bargain, that it is the value of the product or service, the outcome of the product or service itself, They're, they can't hear what you're talking about. You're selling on two different levels. You're trying to show them why this is the best outcome for them by doing whatever it is that you're trying to sell them. And they're thinking about what is this going to cost me? And that gets in the way of the believability of the outcome for the person, depending on whatever it is the attorney is, a, is attempting to sell, because they're only thinking about I mean, I've had attorneys tell me like, these guys are going to go to jail, right? And mm -hmm. they're concerned about how much it costs. Mm -hmm. And and at first it was kind of like, what? Are you kidding me? You know, when I first when I first started to learn, you know, what kind of what the mindset was around that. But I realized that it was the same thing with basically every kind of uh, entrepreneur. You have to you have to actually now this I, obviously this depends on the kind of clientele you want to work with. However, there you have two options. You either raise your value to the clientele that actually has their personal value is on the equality of the outcome. What do I want for that outcome, right? That's where my value is, right? I seek the result more than anything. I don't really care about the cost that much. Or you have people where they have the same principle on the outside, like they're going to experience uh, the result of not doing something. It's going to have the same catastrophic Got catastrophic consequence, but they're more concerned about the money. You will stay stuck in the weeds with those individuals and they'll be terrible clients. Okay. Interesting. So just to kind of clarify on that, the recommendation for somebody who would be in that position, is it more about stuff that they're presenting and they're thinking internally or more about the people that they need to get in front of that they need to break that loop? People they need to get in front of. Okay. Awesome. People they need to get, yeah, absolutely. And if they're, if their client by default is somebody that doesn't have that value where they're where the really because of the station that they are in life is they're living based on on survival every day that's the deal you have to help them see the value in a way where they have the ability to go out and hustle for the money to be able to pay for what they can do money is never the problem it's a symptom of the problem and the idea is shifting that in a person's mind when you're selling them so that the outcome has more importance than the amount of money that they're actually spending to get the outcome. And then understand how you can help them actually acquire those finances to be able to pay you. Okay. You know, that's awesome. And I love that. This is something that I say to clients sometimes when we're talking about this, um, you know, when we're, we're helping people and we do that, like I mentioned, the estate planning stuff, you know, we got clients that are charging four or $5,000 for this stuff. And they're like, people say, Hey, you don't have any money. Well, Hey, look, you know, if you had a fire, if your house is on fire, and there was a guy standing next to the fire hydrant with a wrench and said, I need $5,000.
you'd rob a bank if you had to, you know, people, right, the right. money's yeah. there. You got to figure out how to ask for it. Right. Um, but that actually segues me into something I also wanted to ask. And um, I, know I love this line. I was checking out a video years earlier on, on, on uh, YouTube. Um, you say that sales sucks, <laughs> but there's an interesting way of having. So can you share that with the, with the vibe? Cause I think the, the, the word sales, um, automatically sets up some red flags for some people. I mean, I would say attorneys writ large. Um, I think I like to think that the listeners of this podcast have heard me say that it's not a bad thing enough time. We're a little bit more open to it. But um, what do you think are the major hangups that attorneys have on the practice of sales and investing into the skill set of sales itself? Rejection. Hmm. I mean, so let's think about this for a second. Forget about Forget about what it is the person is selling and what the outcome of that sale is. Human beings don't like rejection, right? Everybody interprets rejection based on your own past experience in life. The only way to get good at sales is to go through a lot of rejection in order to get better. It's a skill set. And primarily, it's a skill set in listening. You know, it's a skill set in listening and asking questions. Most people, they, they over-talk uh, the value of what it is that they have instead of really listening for what what is the value system in the person that I'm actually having a conversation with and finding out finding out what's important to them. And of course, learning how to ask questions that lead to what's important to them. Sometimes people just don't know because they've never been asked the right questions. They're dealing with whatever the problem is that they have in their life. They're only thinking on the terms of that problem, but nobody's asking them intelligent questions about consequences and maybe in multiple areas, depending on whatever the issue is. However, if I have an issue with rejection, I'm not going to be thinking about how do I get to the place in this conversation where I can really trigger this person and influence them into making the right decision because I'm going to be more concerned with the rejection. Either it's based on money or it's based on the fact that I don't feel good about myself if somebody rejects me. Okay, that's super interesting. This is something I actually, I told my sales guys this all the time too. It's like, you have to be willing to lose the sale to be able to win the sale. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's it's kind of funny looking at things through that lens too. I think it's a really, uh, that kind of explains the pattern that a lot of people have. If they try out something new, it doesn't work out. They go back to something comfortable like referrals, which you know, unfortunately are kind of a limited way to be able to scale your practice on your own terms. But, um, you know, you, you also kind of bring this into, because it's like, if you have the fear of rejection, it really wouldn't matter if you'd read every single sales book under the sun and had the training from the best people in the world, Right. Right. Absolutely. You, you, the only way to do it is to integrate it into the way that you think. You, you really need to be thinking from the perspective of, and, you, and there's, some no, there's some things that have to be really known here. You've got to believe in your value of what you can do. You have to believe in the value of the client that you're trying to help them get. Like you have to really believe in that value because it, in a way, sales is a battle of belief systems, right? I'm going to go to somebody and I'm going to talk to them. They're looking for an outcome, but part of the reason why they're not getting the outcome is the belief system that they have about the problem they're in to begin with, or what actually led to that problem. Mm -hmm. So I have to help them kind of dissolve that belief system and develop a faith and an idea in something different. And then they got to put the money on the line to actually be able to do it. So that is that is really part and parcel of how deep that belief is that you're communicating with them that they really can get the outcome that they're actually looking for. And the only way to do that is through repetition. You have to have a solid set of skills that you're learning from someone who's already good at this, like yourself, that's really integrated it into their own mentality and their um, habitual way that they're actually doing the sales. And then they have to go out and model that until they internalize it themselves. Yeah. And I'll say this too, for anyone who's listening, like the frame that the, I have some thoughts about a lot of the things that are standard in the legal industry. And like one of the things that's like, you know, free consultations, for example, but, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, when people bail out themselves by the hour, it's like a lot of times that you're effectively paying people three, four, 500 bucks <laughs> to, to talk to them. And the fact that people take consultations and they don't ask questions as the attorney is shocking to me because this is one of the most important things of like, look, um, I also kind of dislike, you know, and one of the things I love from um, uh, listening to one of your videos earlier, David, was just the fact that like people think that sales is something that you do to people. And you said that sales is something that you do for people. And it's like getting on the same side of people at the end of the day, you owe it to that person to break those limiting beliefs. Um, 
you know, in practice, I think when you have the situation, when you're the person to do that more often than not, they're going to go for you, but you should be willing to do that regardless. It's your job as an expert to kind of like help people yeah, do that. And stuff, right? Yeah. So it's like, I think there's that moral imperative, but yeah, at the end of the day, the value thing is so key because it's just like, like you said, it's like, there's, you know, there's no way, uh, if you don't have that element of being able to pull the trigger when the time is ready, you're not going to be able to do it. It doesn't matter how much training you have. Um, Okay. And then kind of switching gears to as far as what, what people have in terms of their expectations, their value of themselves. Um, one of the things I found fascinating that I love what you talk about is, is helping people break the limits that people allow themselves to have in terms of income. Um, you know, making your 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 annual income in a uh, in a month, for example. Yeah. So what do you see are like kind of like the common blockers that attorneys have in terms of the money that they allow themselves to make? Okay. So th- again, this is a really interesting topic. Let's talk about a little bit about how they come up with the income that they're going after to begin with. Most people that are raised, again, middle class, um, and again, I want to I want to reiterate the reason for this so that they make the connection in their mind. When you're raised middle class, when your parents work a job, you have to consider how you learned about money growing up. And it's not just what you heard, but what you actually saw and experienced. Your own interaction as a child with money, like when you asked mom and dad for something and their response was, you don't need that, right? It wasn't, here's, like, it wasn't, um, uh, let me, let's figure out what this costs and how could you earn the money and teaching a child how to become self-sufficient to be able to purchase something for themselves. But the response is, you don't need that. And the idea of need is so prevalent within the working community that we communicate on as if it was a value in and of itself. You don't need that. That's too much. Um, What do you need that for? Uh, You know, don't spend all that money. So what happens subconsciously in these individuals is that the amount of money that they're going to earn in their life is actually based on what they think they need, which is the perception of their lifestyle which might be a degree or two more than their parents if they're even if they're aggressive actually but they don't realize that when they want to increase that amount that they're not going after again this is a value uh narrative they're not going after the value of why they want to increase it they're go, they're basing it off of what they think they need in their life so as even if they set a goal Right. I mean, I've watched this in my in the early years of my business. I was astounded by the lack of breakthrough that people would have with with this. And this is how I learned this. We'd have people set a goal, something that's exciting. Right. Here's here's uh, something, a lifestyle that you want to live. Here's the amount of money that's going to cost to live that lifestyle. And as they would begin to approach it, in other words, they would start to earn a little bit more money than they were making. Their subconscious mind would override their decision, and it would bring them right back down to where they were comfortable. This is a well-known problem in sales organizations all over the world. They will set lofty goals in the beginning of the year or the quarter for what they're going to earn, and they'll start out like a racehorse, and then before you know it, they're right back down to what they made last year. It rarely changes unless they psychologically break through this. And the idea is that you have to change the narrative around what it is that you need to in order to change the amount of money that you'll allow into your life. Because when you're not thinking about it, your subconscious mind will do everything that it can to sabotage this new direction that you want to go. That's why change is so difficult for most people. They do not understand the psychological sabotage that everybody does in order to maintain the safety of where they think they are in life. So what we would do with individuals is we would say, hey, listen, what is the amount of money that you need in order to pay your bills right now? So let's just go with an, an, an arbitrary number. Let's say that person says $5,000. Okay, how much would you like to make? Well, I'd like to make $25,000 a month because I would like to do all these different things and whatever. Fine. How many times have you tried to get there? Well, I've tried many times and then there's all these different things that happen and I just can't seem to break through. So what happens if you increase the amount that you actually need versus going after this $25,000? they would be like, what do you mean? Well, what if you actually went out and spent money and committed to the lifestyle that you're saying prior to earning the money? Now, you've got two things going on here. First of all, if you tell that to somebody who's not 
who does not have the ability to actually go out and earn more money, like somebody that ha just has a job, that would be irresponsible because there's no way that they can actually overcome this, this challenge in their life. But for people that have the ability to earn more, there's another principle that kicks in when they actually do this, and it's responsibility. Because responsibility is something that's very big and driven home in the middle class community, right? You talk to the average person and you say, was responsibility a value that you grew up with? And they're like, oh, yeah, like my parents were sticklers. You had to be responsible. So what happens is that as they raise their need, they also have a level of responsibility to actually meet that need. Now, here's what here's the this is what the, the dark edge around this is. You might think to yourself, well, why is it is it so difficult to break away from this? It has nothing to do with the money, and it actually has nothing to do with what they need. It has to do with the rejection of people that will see them either become rich or actually lose money. They're not afraid of increasing the amount of money. It's the judgment that they will receive from the people that they love when it becomes apparent that they're actually doing much better than anybody in their family has ever done. And um, I would do this exercise in a live, like when we do live events, I would say, let's say um, you leave this event, you go out, get all your friends and family together for a, a dinner. You're going to have a dinner party, right? And you have this big dinner party in the middle of a dinner party. You stand up and you ding your glass and you say, everybody quiet for a second. I've got, a, I've got an announcement I want to make. I have decided that I want to become unbelievably wealthy, right? And, and you'll hear everybody in the auditorium crack up because they know the comments and the eye rolling and all the different digs that they would get making that those comments in front of the people that they were that they were actually raised by fr friends and family that are that are living, you know, in that kind of a lifestyle. Subconsciously, we don't want to lose those people. And we know, we absolutely know 100% that if we start to climb that ladder, almost always those people around us are not going to support us to that degree. They don't have the ability to do it. We like to think that they would, but more often than not, they won't. So we're not actually trying to overcome what we need in order to become wealthy. What we want to, we have to, the problem we really have to solve is how can I get past my own need for acceptance around other people based on the amount of money that I make or that I don't make? And it's extremely significant. But once a person starts to understand it, you explain this to them and you ask them, say, listen, if you were to become really wealthy, it was obvious, you know, like you, you know, you had a, a Ferrari or whatever it is that you want, where it's undeniable that you have money. How would the people around you react? to that. And they'll tell you how they would react to it. And it's usually not good. So the idea is like, if you know this, we can overcome this because basically this is a self-esteem issue, right? It is an acceptance of the way that you want to live, regardless of the opinion of the people that you love. And we do work with them in that area and, and help them get past that because turning your annual income into a monthly income is easy. Anybody can do it in a single month. There's nothing difficult about it. It's about leverage in business. You understand the leverage, you, but you do you change things based on cause and effect. Anybody could could actually make that quantum leap in their business. We do it all the time, but psychologically, it's a completely different story. Okay, that's fascinating, David. And I got a question because I mean, you've had a lot of these breakthroughs happen under your watch. When we talk about this almost fear of success and the fear of the acceptance that they're no longer going to have. Do you help people focus on their perception of what will actually happen? Because I'm sure there's a difference between what people think and what it actually turns out to be after the breakthrough actually happens. Or do you deal with not needing that acceptance in the first place when the time comes? Not needing the acceptance in the first place. So we work on helping them overcome the challenge of making the money. We show them strategically, this is how you break through this need line for yourself but also dealing with the psychological repercussions of that at the same time, right? So it is uh, teaching them how to get their needs met on their own. Here's, here's this another, another interesting piece to this that most people don't realize. When you're biologically, our subconscious mind is an ingenious creation. It is designed to keep us alive when we have no authority over our own autonomy at all, right? So as a baby, we have to have mom and dad there all the time or we die. That's an absolute fact. So the subconscious mind also has to learn how to pattern adjust 
based on um, the infrequency of parent behavior, right? The child doesn't know. It can't communicate. It doesn't have verbal language. So it has to learn behavior based on cause and effect. And the pattern recognition that our subconscious mind is able to put together is absolutely astounding. As long as the parent's not mentally ill or maybe an addict, where, where that would that might not be 100% accurate. But in general, it works. So what ends up happening as a child goes through the developmental stages is that that pattern gets tighter and tighter and tighter. We know how to get our needs met from mom and dad, and we double down on that. Then we take it out into the world, and we learn how to get our needs met that way. But during this process, the thing that we're dealing with is that as a child, everybody has authority over us, right? If somebody doesn't make you consciously aware as you move from a teenager into a young adult, that once you step into that phase of being an adult, you are now your own authority. Your subconscious mind doesn't realize that mom and dad are, are not the authority anymore. And it behaves on a lower end as if that is actually the process. You'd be astounded, and maybe you know this, how many people actually just need permission to go out and make more money. They need somebody to say, it's okay for you to do this because they've never had that before in their life. And they don't have the ability to do it for themselves. So they haven't broken this hierarchy in their mind of who actually has authority over their adult life. Once they become conscious of it, though, we actually teach them how to do pattern changes that are extremely significant within the decisions that they make every day that rewires their mind as they are their own authority. It takes a little bit of time and it, you have to be patient with it, but you have to consistently do it and it works. Once you do that and your subconscious mind realizes you're not going to die because you're making your own decisions, a person will change it forever. And then this money thing won't be an issue anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. And I, I, I mean, this is the first time I've heard it this way. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of vaguely aware of, of these different stages of life, but it's interesting because like, you know, you have these coming of age rituals that have been part of cultures for so many hundreds of years. And even like up until the 20th century, we had entire, entire generations that went off to war and came back men or did this or did that. But um, it's kind of been an interesting situation in the last, you know, 40, 50 years of peace where there's not too much going on. And I can even imagine why um, somebody who chooses a profession like being an attorney, it's like, well, you know, you're kind of submitting to a more hierarchical way of getting ahead in life. Um, you know, you, you're a good doobie, you get your good grades in law school, you know, you go to the big law firm and that's as hierarchical as anything else that exists. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when you're finally out on your own, it's like, there's no one there to anoint you, but um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of throw this out there too, because you know, there's, there's a lot of people that fashion themselves. And I think, you know, attorneys more than anyone else, these hyper rational people that think that there's no way that I couldn't see this. But the truth is, it's like, you really can't see the options that are outside yourself until you really give yourself I mean, um, you know, the breakthroughs that that you've seen, I'm sure are just like, you know, do you have any kind of like quick, uh, you know, one off studies of what happens when people are able to, you know, remove these blind spots of what happens to them financially? Well, I'll, I'll start out tell you mine. Um, I was a high school dropout. I got married very early in life, very young. Uh, I had two children and I had no skills. So I was, I managed to get enough skill to drive a forklift or drive a truck, but I was not making enough money uh, to support the family. And we were not disciplined in our spending. We overspent like a lot of people in their youth do. But I got, we got ourselves into a bad situation. Our car was repossessed. We filed for bankruptcy. We couldn't even afford an attorney, we had to do it ourselves. Yeah, we had to leave our apartment in the middle of the night. We were on food stamps. It was a really bad situation. And I was desperately trying to figure out how to turn it around. I, I learned enough out of that experience to realize these were mistakes or the results of mistakes that I had made from poor judgment. But now I needed to change it. And how do I actually change this? And the the I was stuck, so to speak, basically, because I thought the only way for me to change this is to go back to school and further my education and I needed time and money to do that, but I was working six and a half days a week just to be able to not make enough to live the way that we were living. So for two years, I'm struggling, trying to figure out ways how to make extra money here, extra money there. Can I sell something? Can I buy something and fix it up and sell it? Like I was all different kinds of things I was trying to come up with. I was making no headway. And then it got to the point where the stress was just unbelievable. And I, 
I had a real meltdown one night at work and I just started sobbing and I was like, God, if you're there, show me something. I don't know what to do. I'm completely stuck. I don't know what to do. And this voice in my head said, David, change your attitude. And so I worked that through and I came up with three things that I was going to work on changing inside of myself. And it was kind of like, I don't even know if this is going to work. It makes no sense to me how my attitude is connected with my income, but I'm going to change it. So it was like, I'm going to act like I love what I do. I'm going to do every job to the best of my ability. And I'm going to treat people with total respect. Those were the three things that I was going to start working on immediately. 30 days later, my income tripled wow. and it tripled because I could see opportunity where I couldn't see it before. I was so miserable and stuck in the facts of my demise that I couldn't see any kind of opportunity. And I didn't know that. I really didn't know it. Um, as I began to change, as I began to change my attitude, my perception changed. And as my perception changed, I was able to take in new information and take advantage of an opportunity that had been around me for two years that I had no idea was an opportunity. I mean, it's that crazy. And I've done this with, I, you know, I don't know, thousands of people. I've been doing this for 24 years this year professionally. And we've worked with thousands of people who have the same experience. It's the craziest thing as they actually begin to change what they believe consciously change what they believe and stay focused on uh, very certain principles, all of a sudden the opportunities to do the things that they need to do begin to show up, whether it's the people that they need to hire, the customers that they need to find that they didn't believe were there, the people that'll pay them more, which they were 100% convinced didn't exist or wouldn't buy from them, uh, to you know um, all kinds of like serendipitous opportunities that just seem to show up out of nowhere. And it happens with constant regularity. I mean, and all it is is a perception change. But it's yeah. a conscious perception change, really focused on very specific principles that allow you to see your world very differently. Yeah. And I just want everyone to think, it's like, I'm sure this is the case all the time. It's like, it's not like these things are, are, are popping out of nowhere. I'm sure there's situations where people are finding stuff they were you know, basically sitting on top of or next to the yes. entire time. And if you have a situation where you're listening to this and there's, there's, you know, you're stuck, you feel like there isn't a next step you take. It's like, you know, the, the, the answers could be closer than you think. Um, okay. And I think that when we're actually getting super tight on time, I want to be respectful of your time, David, but that might be the perfect segue to next step. So um, if people are resonating with this, what's the best way to get into your world? So there's two, two things that they could do. They could listen to our podcast where you can really get a feel for everything that we teach. That's called the successful mind podcast. And our website is lifeisnow.com. It's life is now or life is now inc.com. We just redid it with the new with the new uh, uh, tag on it. So in there is a leadership assessment that'll that takes 10 minutes to do. It'll tell you what kind of leader you are so that you have an understanding of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and where you should be working. Oh, that's fantastic. And then, um, yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out. You know, and I'll also make sure we got that in the show notes. <laughs> you might be seeing me in the new leadership assessment coming up, David. So keep an eye out for that. But, <laughs> um, but thank you again so much for the time, David. This has been super eye-opening. Um, I hope you guys have, uh, you know, this is the gems all throughout this podcast. So definitely recommend a, a re-listen for anyone who's doing it. But um, thanks you so much, David, for taking the time. And for everybody else, I'll see you guys next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern on the Law Firm Growth Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.